On the 19th of May, 1970, Ontario police were called to a house in a quiet rural setting. Inside, they discovered the body of a woman, the victim of a brutal and cold-blooded attack. It was horrendous. It was one of those cases that I felt could be repeated. The person uh, was very capable of doing it again. It wasn't long before detectives realized they were tracking a serial killer, one who targeted women in isolated locations. We still don't know why he picked those houses. He just knocked on doors, and it was their misfortune to become murder victims. Ontario, Canada. The rolling landscape north of Toronto is dotted with picturesque towns and idyllic farms. With little violent crime, residents are trustworthy and quick to offer help to strangers in need. But in 1970, that rural hospitality was abused by a brutal criminal, one whose crimes soon sparked a massive manhunt. In May that year, Albert and Doreen Morby were living near the town of Gormley, just 35 kilometers north of Toronto. Although Doreen had worked full time, she now spent her days at home, looking after the couple's 21-month-old son. She was a nurse and uh, she had a small baby. Her husband was a school teacher and she lived in a modern home, but in a rural setting. That is to say, there was no neighbors really close by her. For all intents and purposes, she was happily married, had a good position, and was at, at peace with the world, really. Wednesday the 6th of May started off like every other weekday, as Albert Morby set off at 7.45 to work, a 15-minute drive away. She uh, uh, said goodbye to her husband, went off to work, went off to teach school, and she was at home with her son. She had a number of visitors in the morning. The callers that morning were all known to Doreen Morby. But sometime after lunch, a stranger knocked on her door. We don't know how he got in. We don't know what sort of ruse he used to, to gain entrance into Mrs. Morby's home. Someone knocked on the door, we feel, knocked on the door. And she let them in under some pretense or other. In the minutes that followed, the day took a horrific and tragic turn. At five o'clock that afternoon, Doreen's husband, Albert, returned home from work. And when he arrived home, he discovered that the front door of the house was locked which was unusual. Mrs. Uh, Morby was usually always um, at home, and when he knocked, there was no answer. Albert let himself in and walked through the house, calling for his wife. When he went into the house, he found his, uh, his wife um, lying in a pool of blood with their 21-month-old son, Brent, under, with his legs pinned underneath her. This little infant playing around the kitchen floor, unharmed, playing with the body of his mother. Mrs. Morby was shot a total of seven times, five times in the head and twice in the back. This person, whoever was doing this, decided for certain that she was dead. It's like this tragic event, getting up, go to work, and you kiss your wife goodbye, and all of a sudden you come home at night and your whole world is upside down. He subsequently took Brent, um, his son, and ran down the road to the neighbor's house in order to get help. Ontario Provincial Police cordoned off the isolated house. Along with numerous bullet wounds, evidence suggested that Doreen Morby had been sexually assaulted. One of the most sadistic, meaningless murders that, I, that anybody could ever imagine. 
I kind of thought it might have been somebody local that knew she was alone. Doreen's body was removed for a post-mortem examination as forensic experts combed the scene for clues left behind by the killer. The uh, corporal with the identification unit, uh, Charlie Rosam, attended the scene and uh, took all the necessary photographs and exhibits. The job of an identification officer is important. We're the keepers of all the evidence. Photography is a large portion of what we do in recording crime scenes. On our approach, we'd be looking for tire track evidence, footwear patterns. In that incidence, you're looking at uh, photo photography of the print, the photographs that were taken by the identification unit officers, which were black and white photographs at that time. Corporal Rosam at the time took fantastic notes and had great continuity of all exhibits that were taken at that particular time. Apart from fingerprints and foot impressions belonging to the Morby family, police came away empty-handed. Even the shell casings from the fired bullets had been removed from the scene. While police continued to search for a lead, news of the violent attack rocked the peaceful rural area. It was quite a, a chilling sort of uh, um, uh, event to have occurred in, in that small community. And in those days, rural areas, people uh, left the doors unlocked and sort of, you know, trusted your neighbor. Because there's an innocence lost when, when these things happen. Meanwhile, the post-mortem examination shed more light on the crime. Since more than six bullets had been used to murder Doreen Morby, investigators felt that the killer had used a 22 caliber weapon with a larger than normal ammunition chamber. The belief was back in 1970 that Mrs. Morby had been shot uh, by someone using a 22 caliber revolver that was possibly nine shots. The theory was that the killer would unlikely reload after discharging the, the usual six bullets in a, in a revolver. And a nine-shot revolver in 1970 um, was not a very common gun. Due to the sexual assault, the killer also left behind bodily fluid in the form of semen. Although DNA testing wasn't yet available as a forensic tool, investigators were able to perform a simple blood typing test. Not only did the killer possess type A blood, he carried an even rarer form known as type A secreta, a blood type possessed by only one third of the population. Armed with this new information, police fanned out to interview friends, family members, and persons of interest in the community. Anybody who became a suspect provided blood samples back then, but all they could tell you was whether they were A, B, or O. You could have lots of suspects who are A secretors. And so, how do you eliminate them? The 13th of May, 1970, one week since the murder. Despite the scientific ability to clear certain suspects, there were no big breaks in the case. At Ontario Provincial Police Headquarters, the investigation file was named Murder Number Three so-called because it was the third unsolved murder of the year. Within a week, they would be facing murder number four. The 14th of May, 1970. The violent sexual assault and murder of Doreen Morby had sent shockwaves through Ontario. Although police knew the blood type of the killer, as well as the kind of weapon used, they had few concrete leads. Russell and Helen Ferguson also lived in a rural area outside Toronto, just 40 kilometers west of the crime scene. We had heard about it uh, and it, we knew it was way over on the other side of the city. Uh, I remember being somewhat concerned 
The Fergusons shared the same professions as the family that fell victim to the attack. Russell was a teacher, and his wife Helen, although now at home with their three children, was trained as a nurse. And my mother was a stay-at-home mom. We were young and rambunctious, and I had a brother that was six at the time, and uh, my sister was five, so... Yeah, life was, was good, of course. Helen had devoted herself to looking after and raising three children. I guess typical children, full of life, and so on. Uh, it was a nice spot for them, lots of room for them to romp and play when they were at home. We were a close family. The 19th of May started normally for the family, with the exception of the eldest son, Dale, being ill. Dale had had mumps, and he was sick in bed. And so I said, you get a doctor's appointment lined up. For, for Dale, and I'll be home. And so off I went to work. Later that day, with Helen and her son Dale both at home, a stranger pulled up to the house. I'm not even sure what time it was when there was a knock on the door. And he saw his mother go to the, to the door. And when she returned and came in the house, it was a gentleman with her. She stuck her head in the door, and behind her was this man that I had never seen before. And she told me that this man had a sick boy in the car and that she was going to give him directions to the hospital. She was marched upstairs, and it's felt that he had a weapon on her at all times. And then, uh, you know, I went back to watching TV, forgot the guy was even there. To the best of my recollection, it was a, uh, at least an hour later, I would say. I heard three loud bangs. I had no idea what they were. At the time, I thought they were fireworks or firecrackers. That was the first thought was, mummy and that man are playing with fireworks. He went to see what was happening. He saw the intruder was leaving uh, through the back door as Dale looked up, and he was wiping fingerprints off of door handle. And he uh, rubbed the doorknob, and out he went. He also looked out the window and saw the car. It was a gravel driveway. Stones flew in the air. The guy sped away. The house was deadly silent, so I... Uh... I called my mother's name a couple of times and uh, looked down the hallway and she was laying in what turned out to be a pool of blood. She had a look on her face, which I can't forget. And I just knew she was dead, lifeless eyes. and She just didn't look like my mother at all. It would have to be a horrendous uh, ordeal for a boy of eight years old to go through. He, in turn, for an eight-year-old boy, was very alert and, and called to the police. Around the same time, Russell Ferguson returned from work, unaware of the violent attack that had just taken place. I got home and came in, and first thing I, I saw was how lying on the floor and his blood. And, I never dreamed of what the reality was. And I was over and put my ear down to her breast and I could hear her heart beating. And that ended up, it wasn't, it was mine, but it was just thumping my ears. And he was pretty distraught and yelling, uh, oh, Helen, or oh my God, Helen, or something to this effect. And... All I remember is waiting for police and everybody else to arrive and thinking, what a gorgeous day. How could anything like this happen on a day like that? It was, it was just a, an absolute beautiful day, and, and here was this complete opposite end, this grisly, horrible, ghastly thing that happened. Ontario Provincial Police quickly secured the scene. For investigators, the crime bore a striking resemblance to the attack that had taken place less than two weeks earlier. 
Mrs. Ferguson had been shot three times, um, once in the back and twice in the back of the head. It was very, very similar in every way. Even the victims were very similar, and there were no casings left around the place. So the person who did this knew what he was doing. Charlie Rosa once again shows up at the scene of Helen Ferguson, and once again does his job of an identification officer and takes all of the necessary photographs, measurements, exhibits. Just like Doreen Morby, Helen Ferguson had been sexually assaulted by someone possessing the blood type A secreta. Ballistic tests pointed to a similar weapon, one police believed to be a nine-shot 22 revolver. The family's similar backgrounds suggested they may have been deliberately targeted rather than picked at random. Both the husbands were teachers, both of the wives were nurses, so people were starting to think, you know, is this Ontario's first serial killer? Is he going to strike again? Fear spread throughout the region as the media reported widely about a criminal now dubbed the 22 caliber killer. These two murders uh, transfixed the greater Toronto area. It was the most uh, shocking sort of series of murders that had occurred in the area for, for years and years and years. It's seldom that in two small villages north of Toronto, opposite ends of the city, that uh, two women are, are killed within 11 days. This guy snuffed out two women, gained entrance to their home, raped them, shot one of them seven times. What rage he must have had toward that woman and uh, to do that. More than 30 investigators were soon on the case, their hopes resting on a lone witness, nine-year-old Dale Ferguson, the boy who'd looked directly into the eyes of the man who'd murdered his mother. Police sketch artist Jim Majuri met Dale, hoping to recover an image from the memory of the traumatized young boy. I remember that the, the young boy was very intelligent. Children, by f I think, are by far the best witnesses because they're uninhibited. If you, if you use the right tact, you can get a lot of information from a young a youngster. But it was a rather daunting task to come up with a picture of somebody that I probably saw for less than 25 seconds. I had photographs of, mostly they were mug shots. The idea was for the witness to pick out similarities to help with the, the initial drawing. You're, you're basically picking facial features. I suppose for an adult it would be maybe a little bit more of a precise method of getting a description of somebody, but certainly at eight years old I was, I was very confused by it all. Making one of those sketches is not easy. The composite revealed a dark complexion suspect of medium height between 35 and 40 years of age and driving a 1964 or 1965 beige rambler. As the public was enlisted in the hunt, a critical milestone approached. Although stories varied as to the exact number of days between the attacks, fear turned to panic over thoughts that the 22 caliber killer was about to strike again. There was some thought in the greater Toronto area that we have a maniac loose and what's going to happen in 11 days. And the police thought that as well. And it was one of the largest manhunts ever in the history of Ontario, maybe in, in the history of Canada. Could this guy strike 11 days after the second killing? Was he going to strike every 11 days for some weird reason? Well, it couldn't be overlooked. So when the 11th day rolled around, there was this kind of like an alert. It's a rare, rare case where anyone ever stops. They usually escalate. May 1970. Rural Ontario was being held hostage by a serial killer who'd left two women dead in less than two weeks. With fears that a third attack would soon follow, all unusual encounters in the region were reported in the press and on television, producing panic and a reign of terror. 
In the tense atmosphere, a widely circulated sketch of the killer and his car led to a flood of 200 tip-offs a day. Ontario Provincial Police Officer Don McNeil spent his days tracking down the leads. When tips came in, there was a, a tip sheet filled out. You know, John Brown phoned to say that, you know, I think the composite looks like my neighbor. And, and so the, these things had to be checked out. Knowing that the killer's blood type was type A secreta, investigators concentrated on trying to narrow their search. A way that we eliminated a lot of people was that we had them submit to a saliva sample by spitting on a Kleenex. It's not like DNA where you, can, you get this number that says, hey, it's him, and there's no way it's anybody else. It's one in the world. This number identifies you, it identifies me. An A secretor doesn't identify you. It helps you to narrow it down but there's no way that you could convict on a person being an ace secretor. By the end of 1970, more than 2,000 suspects had been interviewed and hundreds of beige ramblers had been investigated across the country. Interest in the case began to fade and tips from residents dried up. As a reporter for the Toronto Sun, Max Haynes tried to keep the murders in the public's mind. The case fascinated me that someone could snuff out the lives of two young women really in the prime of their life and, uh, and get away with it. Cold turkey. I would write about it and the fact that it was still unsolved and thinking that it would jar someone's memory. With a killer still on the loose, there was little peace for the families of the victims. Although Albert Morby decided to remain in the family home, the same home where his wife was murdered, the Ferguson family, faced with the constant fear that the killer might return, left the area. It was reasonably possible that the killer would come back and kill Dale Ferguson because he was the only witness to the crime. I had seen this person, so there was a concern for my safety. Dale, when I, we would go for a walk, he was tailing me everywhere I went, but I couldn't move two inches without him moving. So there was a lot going on inside him. He, he was living a, a life of hell. <laughs> Mr. Ferguson had to split up his family, split, out, split up his children and himself from his family at the most traumatic time in their lives. And so on, I thought, well, I've got to have the children somewhere where they can't be traced. And so they're all sent off to different places with relatives or friends. Instead of them having their family unit together, Mr. Ferguson, Dale, Scott, and Pam all lived in different residences. And they'd lost their mother. September 1973. Although three years had passed, police suddenly received their most promising lead to date when the landlady of a lodging house called in about one of her former tenants. Not only did she think the man resembled the composite sketch, he used to own a beige-colored rambler. Tips from other tenants also pointed to the same man. And this suspect as well was also known to the people in the area as, as probably having some form of mental illness. He also had a very violent side to him at times. He used to drive around with a coffin in the back of, of one of his cars. Following up on the lead, police finally traced the man to a psychiatric hospital in eastern Canada, where they obtained hair and fluid samples. The suspect had blood type A secreta, just like the 22 caliber killer. But despite widespread suspicions, they were unable to make an arrest. There were numerous people who felt he was the guy. They were just never had enough evidence to, to lay a charge or, or at least be able to obtain a conviction on him. As the years passed, the investigation began to gather dust as a cold case file. Once a case gets to be five, six, seven, eight, and a decade old, police officers resign, they get transferred. I thought it would never be solved. 
It never left me. I always wanted this to get the guy who did this to these two women. And I, I continued to write about it. By 1996, 26 years had elapsed since the brutal crimes. As part of a wide-reaching review of cold case files, the Morby Ferguson investigation was examined once again by Ontario Provincial Police. Don McNeil was now a detective inspector and one of the few police officers still on the force who could remember the original attacks. I said, listen, I know a little bit about this case because I worked on it originally in 1970. Inspector McNeil was a young police officer at the time of the murders. But now it ends up on his desk and there's this old Morby Ferguson case in his lap. That's how it happened. It was just, it was assigned to him as a cold case. But then he, he dug in. Remarkably, the original crime scene specimens were still intact in police storage vaults. The IDEN officer in 1970 by the name of Charlie Rosam, he had worked on both homicides and he had packaged and preserved all the exhibits as though he knew something was going to be used on them down the road. Since the original investigation, forensic science had advanced. Instead of crude blood typing tests, the advent of DNA profiling allowed police to match suspects to crime scenes with much greater accuracy. Don McNeil submitted the semen sample of the 22 caliber killer for scientific analysis. He soon had the man's unique genetic fingerprint. Hoping to finally confirm a long-held suspicion, he then re-examined the file of the prime suspect in the Morby Ferguson murders. The man police had interviewed in a psychiatric hospital back in 1973. There had been hair samples taken from him and uh, we had them identified. It turned out that it wasn't the right uh, DNA profile. Most people were convinced, police included, that he had committed these atrocious offenses and, and he had not. Using the new science, other suspects from the early 1970s were eliminated one by one. Without new evidence, the murderer now seemed beyond the reach of justice. On the 7th of June, 1995, at a shop in Sault Ste. Marie, a man walked in and started talking to the shop assistant, claiming to be purchasing a gift for his wife. He took the clerk to an area of the store that wasn't visible to the rest of the store, pulled out a black handgun, pointed it at her and told her that he was gonna tie her up. He uh, tied up her hands and feet, dragged her to a closet, and he went through the clerk's purse, took credit cards, and about $480 worth of cash from her and some costume jewelry. The crime was similar to other robberies in the region. Ed Pellerin was a detective stationed in Northern Ontario. Composite drawings were made of the uh, suspect from, as a result of interviews from all the victims, and they looked similar. On the 16th of June, the same man approached a fur and jewelry shop elsewhere in Sault Ste. Marie. She showed him around the store, uh, showed him different uh, items of jewelry that were on sale and uh, he pulled out a black handgun pointed it at her tied her up tied her hands and feet he went through her purse took a quantity of cash and uh, about thirty thousand dollars worth of men's and women's jewelry One of the stolen rings turned up at a shop in Sudbury. The person pawning it was captured on video using his own identification. The man's name was Ronald Glenn West. A search of his house turned up more stolen items, along with latex gloves and the rope used in the crimes. Ron was arrested, charged with numerous uh, counts of armed robbery and weapons offenses. He uh, pled guilty to those offenses and was sentenced to eight years incarceration. 
Although the case on Ronald West seemed closed, another discovery at his house revealed a strange hidden cache. Eventually, the house was purchased by uh, another couple, and they started a major renovation to the house. And while renovating the basement, they removed some cedar ceiling boards, and a plastic bag had fallen out. And the bag contained several empty ring boxes. They also located an envelope which contained two firearm permits in the name of Ron West, uh, dated in 1968-1969. One of the gun permits was for a rare nine-shot 22 caliber pistol. Later that year, in a standard review of cases, Ed Pellerin happened to be discussing the Ronald West file with Inspector Don McNeil. The gun permit discovery immediately caught his attention. The weapon which they felt was used in, in the murders of Doreen Morby and Helen Ferguson was believed to be a nine-shot 22 caliber pistol. This weapon was registered on December the 29th of 1969 and sold in 1972, but yet this individual still kept this piece of paper. McNeil discovered that Ronald West had been employed as a Toronto police officer between 1966 and 1971, within the time frame of the 22 caliber killings. Other officers that, that we spoke to that he worked with uh, thought he was kind of a quiet guy, um, kept to himself. Nothing outstanding or anything along these lines. Well, in the year 1970, I was a police constable with the uh, Toronto Police in the uh, 53 Division. He was one of the officers on, that I uh, worked with. He's been described, uh, I've heard, as a loner, but, uh, you know, in those days, I didn't think he was a loner. He, he was just a regular guy at the time. Nothing uh, stuck out that you know, would point your finger at him this, to be capable of this stuff. He did nothing outstanding in his years in the force, but on the other hand, he did nothing detrimental as well. He was an average police officer doing his job. A lot of his jobs um, in the late 80s and early 90s were working for mining companies, and his nickname at one of the mining companies was The Ghost, because when work ended at the end of the day, um, the workers never saw him. So his nickname was The Ghost. And I noticed that he did vacation in the area of Doreen Morby. And I also noticed that where he lived, he would have to drive by Helen Ferguson residence. I got thinking, well, we got the firearm certificate, it's a nine shot. We got the fact that he knows the area. And we got the other fact that, that he was a police officer at the time. I thought, well, this fella could be a good suspect. A team was assembled to look more closely at Ronald West. But what investigators had is they had two homicides from 1970. They had a, a suspect now, but they needed some way of trying to figure out whether that individual's DNA would match that DNA from the homicides. With only the slightest circumstantial evidence, obtaining a warrant for a blood sample was not an option but Ed Pellerin had an idea. When Ron was in custody uh, in 1995 in Sault Ste. Marie on the armed robbery charges, he had mailed his wife a letter from the jail. She felt a little embarrassed that, that her husband would commit these armed robberies and home invasions and uh, basically didn't want to have anything to do with them after that. She called us, asked if we were interested in the letter. She was going to throw the envelope out and on her consent, she turned the letter over, over to us. The chances are he licked the stamp. Let's see if we can get a DNA profile. Police sent the stamp to the Center of Forensic Sciences, and they were able to take DNA extraction from the back of the stamp and get a DNA profile. When that profile was developed, it was something like a fingerprint. Um, that was compared to the DNA profile found in the, the semen, 
which was on uh, some of the the uh, the items of clothing worn by Mrs. Morby and Mrs. Ferguson when they were murdered. Although not conclusive, the two samples appeared to be extremely similar. Ronald West was now the most promising suspect in more than two decades. Really all that the profile did on the stamp was tell us that the person who had licked the stamp was a strong suspect or a suspect for those homicides in 1970. We still had to do a lot of work. But what it did, it gave us sufficient grounds at that time to obtain a, a warrant, a blood warrant. Police now prepared to get legal permission to take a blood sample directly from their suspect. But even if the blood did provide a strong DNA match, they still faced the daunting task of trying to convict a suspect for crimes that were more than a quarter of a century old. In January 1999, Ontario police investigating a 29-year-old double murder were building a case against former police officer Ronald West. While waiting to take DNA samples directly from their suspect, they put together all the exhibits from the original investigation. Forensic expert Gary Savage helped dig through police storage lockers and vaults. What we had to ensure was no evidence had been misplaced. There's always the, uh, the chance that something could be mislaid or, or lost. There were photographs taken of various things. Photographs of all the boxes were taken so that not only seals, every seal that was ever placed on the boxes were documented, uh, also any writings that were on the boxes. Once again, the meticulous work of Charlie Rosam, the original forensic expert on the case in 1970, proved invaluable. Charlie had done a phenomenal job in, in packaging and creating exhibit logs um, over the period that he was involved in the investigation. On the 26th of March, 1999, Investigators were finally ready to meet their suspect face to face. Armed with a DNA warrant, they hoped to seal the fate of Ronald West with the help of modern science. A team was put together to go to Kingston and we attended the Collins Bay Penitentiary. The particular procedure uh, was reported that we would do audio and video taping at a particular time, so that had to be set up. With everything in place, Ronald West was brought to the interrogation room. Although surprised by the arrival of police, he agreed to cooperate, denying any involvement in the Morby Ferguson murders. He was then led to a sterile room in the prison where police obtained a sample of his blood. He uh, maintained his innocence. He told us he would never plead guilty. He'd never committed the crimes. At the Center for Forensic Sciences, DNA from Ronald West's blood was compared directly with that left at the crime scene. This time, the result was conclusive. Inspector McNeil called me and he had received the DNA results and said, Max, I gotta tell you, we got him. It's a match. They got the guy. The odds of the 22 caliber killer being anyone other than Ronald West are staggering. You can't do it at all. Once you see all the figures, I believe it was one in 12 billion. So that kind of eliminated everybody in the world, plus Jupiter and Mars and the guys in the space shuttle. So we figured we had the right guy. On the 25th of August, 1999, Ronald West was charged with the 1970 murders of Doreen Morby and Helen Ferguson. Faced with overwhelming evidence, he finally decided to plead guilty. There was no way that they were going to be able to beat the DNA evidence. But even though he confessed to the crimes, West refused to explain what motivated his brutal rampage. 
It's the one thing that, you know, Mr. West did say to us too. Just purely coincidental that they were both nurses and the husbands were both teachers. They both had kids at home that day. Just coincidental. News that an ex-police officer was the 22 caliber killer came as a terrible shock to the public and former colleagues. At a time when he was entrusted to enforce the law, Ronald West turned to murder. The word that comes to mind is disgust. But if a police officer knocks on our door right now, we'd say, what can we do for you? I mean, you'd, oh, you'd open the door. You just do. There's a confidence we have in authoritative figures. It is believed by many that um, the killer very well might have uh, distributed the posters, the wanted posters, uh, containing the description of the killer and the description of his car. Before receiving his final sentence, Ronald West faced the surviving family members of his two victims. And uh, showed no remorse whatsoever. All I could think about when I watched him was how many other women have you killed or how many other people have you killed? I think he sat there motionless as far as I could see. Beyond me to fathom how one operates mentally that way. All I was concerned is that he gets out of circulation, that he can't do it again. That same day, Ronald West was sentenced to a life term in prison. The more I've thought about it, there is no way to adequately punish him. I don't think he'll ever actually get what he deserves. He basically already got away with it for 30 years. That was 30 years of uh, life he didn't deserve. After more than 30 years, the 22 caliber killer had finally been brought to justice. It, it, it became certainly Ontario's largest unsolved case to be solved and maybe Canada's. I've never heard of one that was longer. From a story point of view, it was, it was just a great piece of investigative work from two police officers, from Don McNeil and from Ed Pellerin, in order to be able to piece these things together. You can have all the DNA in the world, but unless you have a police officer with a, with a long memory to make the connection uh, between uh, this case and his days as a young constable, the, the DNA would not have solved it. Perseverance does pay off. You, you always got to speak for the dead, sort of thing. And as long as you can keep doing that, then uh, you know, hopefully you'll get results. Ronald West remains behind bars in an Ontario prison. Sentenced according to the law as it stood in 1970, he is eligible for parole after just 10 years. I think that there'll be several people that will be at the parole hearing whenever time he comes up to try and keep him in. Would you like him living next door to you? Most of the time, identification officers deal with property and evidence and things of that nature. Very rarely do we have the kind of contact that I did with victims. It really struck a chord with me that the impact one random act of violence can have onto another generation of people.